So today we're talking about metabolic flexibility or metabolic inflexibility. And really this is an important concept to get your head around if you want to understand type two diabetes and metabolism. Because many of these metabolic conditions have an element um, of metabolic inflexibility. So, you know, type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, uh, obesity, fatty liver disease, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and even cardiovascular disease. So, if you understand uh, what metabolic flexibility is, why you might be metabolically inflexible and then what you can do about it, uh, then you can slowly work to try and correct this. So let me orientate you first. So on the left here, we've got the different fuel sources. So carbs, or glucose and fat are the two predominant fuel sources that the body uses to burn, um, create energy and for those cells to use that energy to function. So we've got carbs, carbs and fat and fat and I'll explain um, sort of that in a moment. But before we get into that, I just want to, I guess, educate you about where this is actually taking place. So when you consume food, the food, the fat uh, and the carbs, the fat and the glucose needs to get into the cell and all of this actually occurs in the mitochondria where the energy is actually produced. So the carbs or the, sugar, the glucose and the fat are turned into what we call ATP. So ATP is basically the energy currency in the body or the energy currency of the cells. So the mitochondria, this is not to size. Um, so in all of your cells, you have lots and lots and lots of um, these little mitochondria. So you think of them as the, the powerhouse of your cells. So they um, are responsible for turning the food that you eat into energy that the cell can use. So basically, when you eat a meal, the body will preferentially want to use glucose for fuel and if you've eaten a meal and you have glucose coming into the body into the blood then you need to do something with that glucose um, so what happens is normally this is someone who's metabolically flexible you will flip the metabolic switch so if you think of this as like a funnel um, coming into the mitochondria so we've got carbs and fat. So when you eat a meal um, that contains some carbohydrates, then your metabolic switch will flick over to prefer preferentially burn carbohydrates. So it will flick over and you get some free flowing traffic of carbohydrates coming into the mitochondria. And so the mitochondria is going to preferentially burn um, or use these carbohydrates for fuel. So this is, I guess, necessary because if you don't use up some of these glucose molecules and if you're not um, taking up the glucose and using it, then you can potentially um, get higher blood sugar levels. So this is your body adapting to the incoming food, um, or the incoming uh, carbs, or glucose from that meal. So the other thing that happens is, I mean, there's always messengers being sent to try and coordinate all of this in your body. So your body is very clever at um, coordinating all of this. So when you have that meal, it's the higher levels of glucose, um, you know, not really high in someone who doesn't have diabetes, but you will get a slight increase in your blood sugars after your meal. So it's the sugars and you also get a spike in insulin. So when you have a meal, particularly turning, containing carbohydrates, um, you will get a spike in insulin. That's important because the insulin needs to be there to allow glucose to get into the cell. So insulin would bind to the receptor and it would allow glucose to get into the cells. So then the mitochondria can use some of that for energy. 
Uh, so in this early phase after the meal, in the first sort of two, three, up to four hours, it's the higher insulin and glucose levels um, that will actually suppress fat oxidation. So it will prevent fat from being burnt because basically the body's saying, oh, we've got all this incoming energy. We don't need to burn our fat stores. We need to reserve those fat stores. So that will actually switch off um, the, well, that, that's sort of what helps push the metabolic switch to burn carbs and it turns off um, fat burning. So you're not at that point um, after your meal. If your metabolic is flexible, you'll be burning predomin predominantly carbohydrates and really no fats. Over time, um, as you, you know, have not eaten for a period of time, so after three, four hours, I mean, your insulin levels will start to drop so that um, pressure on the metabolic switch will start to back off which means that your body can start burning some fats. So you start burning some carbohydrates and some fats. And then after that, about four hour mark, I mean, it, it sort of varies on what you've eaten and um, that sort of thing, how big your meal is. But after the sort of four hour mark, then your insulin levels are much lower. Your glucose levels have normalized by then. And so your metabolic switch will actually switch over to predominantly be burning fat. So instead we've got So we've got the metabolic switch flipping over and it's just allowing the fat um, through. So you think of this like a funnel coming into the mitochondria, then you've predominantly got fat coming in. And the fat that is being burnt for energy preferentially is mostly you know, the fat stores that you have in your cells um, or the fat stores that you have in your body, the cells will then respond and start to burn that. So really, um, when you are at this point after a meal, when your insulin levels are high and you're predominantly burning carbs, this is more of an anabolic stage. So you're, um, you know, you're storing that energy, using that energy, um, you're building muscle and you're growing and that sort of thing. Um, but when we go down into the fat burning zone, then it's more of a catabolic um, stage. So you're burning stored energy um, and breaking things down. So that is basically, it's someone who is metabolically flexible. They are able to switch very efficiently in between um, burning fat and burning carbs. So that's fundamentally what metabolic flexibility is. So someone who is very readily and able to switch over um, when needed. So um, someone who is metabolically inflexible, well, this can happen when you are potentially consuming too many carbs and too many fats, or if you're just consuming too many calories overall, um, and if you have already got a lot of fat reservoirs on your body, so if you already have lots of fat there that the mitochondria is trying to deal with, and then you have an influx of more energy and more carbohydrates and more fat, then the mitochondria um, basically gets confused and you go into metabolic meltdown. So if we think of this, um, funnel kind of analogy. So when you have both carbs and fat coming in, you get almost like this bottleneck effect. And then the mitochondria becomes very inefficient. So if you think like peak hour traffic or heavy traffic, 
Um, when you've got too many cars all banked up, it starts to become very slow and inefficient. You know, then you start getting a bit of tension. So when you've got too much energy coming in from both carbs and fat, and that fat is either from your meal or it's that fat reservoir, like I said, on your body. So if you've got all this extra fat um, built up in your cells, um, then you've got all this extra energy. The mitochondria is really getting mixed messages and it doesn't know what to do. And then we get this metabolic meltdown. And what actually happens is the mitochondria sends out these stress signals. Is it saying we've got too much of this energy coming in and these stress signals are basically um, So it goes out and it says, we don't need any more energy in this cell. Can you please not let any more glucose in um, because we're trying to deal with all this backlog here. So it will stand, send out stress signals and it will actually cause insulin resistance. So it's going to block the insulin receptor, which means that glucose can no longer get into the cells. So someone who's metabolically inflexible, you start to get um, this phenomenon build up. So hopefully that makes sense so far. So it's high insulin levels and high glucose after a meal that will suppress fat oxidation. But then if you have all this extra fat, um, either in your meal, so if you have a meal that's high in carbs and high in fat, or you have extra fat reservoirs that it has uh, accumulated in the cells, then this can also suppress or switch off carbohydrate metabolism. So if you have both of them at the same time, then this is going to suppress the metabolism of both carbs and fat. So your mitochondria become very inefficient at burning this fuel, but then you've got all this fuel coming in and this can actually lead to weight gain. And of course, things like insulin resistance, which we um, definitely don't want. And I, I mean, if you think about it, there are no foods that are high in both carbs and fat. I'm talking about whole foods, real foods. So they're either high in carbs or they're high in fat. Really, there's not any foods um, that are high in both. So if you think avocados, avocados are high in fat, but they're low in carbs. If you think of whole grains, whole grains are high in carbs, but low in fat. Uh, you know, we could go through a whole list of them. The only exception is dairy. So dairy is high in fat and it's high in carbs, but evolutionary, the whole point of dairy or the whole purpose of dairy is to feed an infant to cause weight gain and to promote growth. So most foods that come naturally, um, come in, you know, that we haven't adulterated ourselves are only high in carbs or fat. Of course, us humans, we like to just make things taste as good as possible. So we like to put in a whole lot of carbs and fat. And really this is um, causing a lot of problems with metabolism. I mean, it's okay if you're having carbs and fat in a meal if you're not overdoing it because your body will sort of work out um, what to do with that energy. It will, it will use the glucose um, for energy and it will store a little bit as glycogen and then the fat, it will predominantly, you know, use that for, um, you know, building cell walls and some of that will be stored as well. And if you're not eating all the time, then, and you're allowing your body to flip over into the fat burning zone, um, then you'll end up burning some of that fat as well. It's just there as a reservoir. So it doesn't mean you can't have carbs and fat, but it's when we're consuming both and too much, then really we get into um, a lot of trouble in terms of metabolism. So there are a few things that can affect metabolic flexibility. And I'm sure that you're wanting to know what they are. So the first one is exercise. So exercise will, uh, let me write this in blue. promote metabolic flexibility. 
So when you exercise, when you first start exercising, if it's more of that sort of moderate to high intensity where you're getting a bit sweaty, you're getting your puff on, this is going to help push the metabolic switch over to use carbs because now you've got this state of increased demand, so increased energy demand. And so the body will preferentially want to use that glucose because it's more efficient um, for energy so you can actually um, continue on with your the physical activity that you're doing so exercise will um, is really good at flicking the metabolic switch over to promote uh, metabolism of carbs and then when you get into uh, more prolonged exercise so say it's more a lower intensity or even moderate intensity but you go for a longer period of time then you burn up all your glycogen stores and then you actually uh, promoting to flip the switch over to burn some of the fat stores that you have. So exercise is really good and I mean the high intensity exercise has a very potent effect um, and it will really push, um, force that metabolic switch over to pr uh, promote the burning of glucose or carbs. So that is the first one. So exercise is excellent at promoting metabolic flexibility. Then what about, we've already kind of talked about it. Um, meal size. So if you're eating a big meal, particularly if it's high in carbs and fat, then you are going to get this flood of glucose and fat in the blood. And if you already have you know, cells and reservoirs that are quite full of this ex excess energy that hasn't been used, then the mitochondria are going to have a really hard time and you're going to get this bottleneck effect. Um, it's going to send out stress signals and it's going to cause a lot of problems and metabolic inflexibility. Uh, whereas if you're eating sort of smaller meals and if you're eating meals that are, you know, higher in carbs, lower in fat or lower in fat uh, or the other way around, <laughs> um, then that is going to um, sort of take the load off. Then the next one is... Intermittent fasting. So intermittent fasting is an excellent way at promoting metabolic flexibility. Because the longer you go without eating, then you're, the stronger the push on the metabolic switch to go the other way. So it's going to, you know, if you're not a very metabolically flexible person, if you're allowing that time um, for your body to flip over to burn fat, then you're really promoting this me metabolic flexibility. And of course, if you're, um, you know, time restricted feeding, intermittent fasting, if you are losing weight as a result of this and you're removing or you're getting rid of some of the extra fat um, reservoirs that the mitochondria are having to deal with, then this is also going to promote metabolic flexibility. So. Intermittent fasting, time-restricted feeding is a good one. Um, so I put promotes flexibility. Now, what you might be wondering is what about the keto diet? How does that fit in? And in actual fact, the keto diet will make you more metabolically inflexible. Why is that? So if you are consuming a diet that is very high in fat, very low in carbs, then you're essentially making yourself more metabolically inflexible because your body is then not easily going to be able to flip over to use carbs. So when you're eating a diet that is high in fat, your cells actually start to accumulate all this fat and you do become fat adapted. So your, your mitochondria gets um, used to burning fat and your cells become used to using um, the fat um, 
fat as a fuel, but when your cells become full of fat and your mitochondria is burning through it, it basically sends a message to say, we've got plenty of fat in here, we've got plenty of energy, we don't need any glucose. And that will actually send, um, similar to the stress signals, but it will send signals to the insulin receptor saying, we've got plenty of energy in here, we're burning fat, don't let any glucose in because we don't want this happening. So that means when you've been consuming a low, car a low carb keto diet for a long period of time and you've become a little bit more insulin resistant, when you then have a meal that is high in carbohydrates or if you eat any carbohydrates, you are going to see, you know, your blood sugars will actually spike and you're not going to be very good at um, switching over to burn carbs. Basically because you're not able to get the glucose in the cells into the cells in the first place. Now, if you're a young, fit, healthy individual, you've got no underlying insulin resistance, you've got no metabolic disease, no diabetes, and you're not overweight, then, I mean, if you're consuming a keto diet for a period of time, this will happen. You will become more insulin resistant and you'll become less metabolically flexible. But once you go back to eating a combination of carbs and fat, it will probably only take three maybe a few more days um, for you to start to become a little bit more metabolically flexible. But for somebody who already has, you know, uh, who's carrying a lot of extra weight, have diabetes, metabolic syndrome and so forth, then the um, switching back and becoming more metabolically flexible when you've been on a keto diet, it's going to take a lot longer. And um, yeah, so, it depends on the individual that we're talking about, but generally, if you're doing a low carb, uh, or more of a keto diet where it's really high in fat, low in carbs, then you're actually um, becoming more metabolically inflexible. So, I mean, if we were to put this on here, you'd be sort of, So that would be the keto diet. So then I guess on the reverse, we have a a low fat diet. And I'm talking more about a low food, uh, sorry, low fat, whole food, plant-based type diet because the you know traditional low fat diet that was pushed for a long time um, really, I mean, when you talk about low fat diet, it could mean anything, um, but when you're just talking about these low fat processed foods and then people are eating lots of processed carbohydrates, this is definitely not a good diet. And even if you're not consuming as much fat um, and you, if you're overdoing the carbohydrates, the carbohydrates are going to eventually turn into fat and they're going to clog up your cells and that can still lead to metabolic inflexibility. But if you're consuming a whole food plant-based diet, so foods that have not been processed or they're very minimally processed, and you're also um, reducing your fat intake, it means that you don't have this big influx of fat from your diet. So your body is just um, having to deal with the fat reservoirs. So this, um, I mean, if you are particularly overweight, it will maybe take a little bit longer to become more metabolically flexible, which is going to be the case anyway if you are you know, metabolically inflexible because of underlying insulin resistance and obesity. It's going to take a bit longer anyway. But if you don't have that incoming fat to deal with and you just are eating whole foods and not overdoing the food in general, not overdoing the carbs, then your body is going to be better able to flip between the two. So it's going to be better at switching over when it needs to. Um, and you know, if you throw in exercise and you throw in time-restricted feeding and intermittent fasting, 
uh, and you're not you know just snacking all the time then you're going to give your body time to flip over um, to burn carbs after your meals and then you know allowing time in between your meals um, will allow you to flip over into that fat burning zone um, so you know exercising as well is going to help push it even further um, and intermittent fasting and time restricted feeding will have more of a, a stronger push on that metabolic switch okay and the next one so running out of room here so type of fat you eat also matters so if saturated fats are a little bit different so the fats that we consume are handled a little bit differently in the body saturated fats are more stable and generally they are stored preferentially so when you consume them they're more likely to be stored either in your adipose subcutaneous fat um, or in your cells as a, a sort of um, excess energy or as storage energy so when you do need to flip over into fat oxidation um, you'll be burning things like saturated fat but if you're consuming a lot of saturated fat in your diet so saturated fat comes from mostly your animal products um, so your meat your poultry your fish your dairy your eggs um, and then you've got your trans saturated fat which is actually far worse and this comes there's a little bit in animal products but predominantly it comes from all your processed foods um, and your partially hydrogenated oils which are used in processed foods so vegetable oils and that sort of thing these will uh, really contribute to clogging up the, the mitochondria um, and the metabolic switch uh, so saturated fats will contribute more to this metabolic meltdown if you're overdoing them and it will contribute to more stress on the mitochondria whereas unsaturated fats come from all your uh, you know whole food predominantly plant-based foods but not all so your extra virgin olive oil your nuts and seeds your um, avocados you know a bit of fish oil and uh, so forth so these unsaturated fats are used a little bit differently in the body because they are more flexible um, so they have double bonds in them which make them more flexible uh, they are used for different things in the body so they're more likely to be used to make the cell walls because these cell walls need to be um, a little bit more flexible uh, and for other things in the body so the unsaturated fats are used differently and they're less likely to clog up um, the metabolic switch and less likely to um, contribute to this metabolic inflexibility so that is pretty much all I wanted to say on that today so hopefully that makes sense uh, the real ultimate aim here is to try and improve your metabolic flexibility. So these are a few little hacks uh, to help, uh, to little things that you can do that can have quite profound effects. And I mean, weight loss can help if you're getting rid of some of the extra fat storage. Um, because then you know you don't have the fat coming through as well as all the glucose that you're um, that you've got there as well but exercise is definitely one of the most potent ways to flip that metabolic switch and to really promote metabolic flexibility as well as intermittent fasting and time restricted feeding they're probably the two best ways um, to promote metabolic flexibility so I hope this has been helpful and I hope this has um, given you a bit more insight. If you have liked it, make sure you like down the bottom. Any comments are welcome. If you think any of your friends or family would also find it helpful, then make sure you share it with them. 
I also have a online program and the program is for people who are really keen to beat diabetes, people who are really um, serious about it and they're willing to invest you know, time, money and commit to uh, making these lifelong changes. So the program itself dives into all the things that are driving insulin resistance. Um, we don't just focus on sugars because, I mean, of course that is important, um, but the program takes a really deep dive into what the root causes of diabetes and insulin resistance. Um, and then to give you as many practical tips and pointers um, to try and really treat it properly. So if you are, are at all interested and you're willing to um, invest and commit to a 12-week program, then make sure you book in a telephone consultation with either myself or one of my team members and we can see if it's going to be suitable for you or not. All right, thank you.